All right. Well, uh, here's our next interview in a series of interviews Matt and I are doing on Good Soul Investment Management's YouTube channel. And we're excited today to get two young entrepreneurs, Shezen and James, uh, who I've gotten to know a bit personally in the last uh, few months. And uh, you guys have quite an interesting story. I mean, uh, you're both you both were students at Duke University, and I think you've taken a sabbatical. You've dropped out temporarily to kind of start your own business now and Bitcoin focus. Tell us a little, a little bit about like your background and, and what you were studying at Duke and how old you are now and, and what your what your thought process was around uh, leaving to start this business, if you don't mind. Yeah, so um, uh, hello everybody, I'm James. Um, I would have been a junior at Duke University. I was studying math and computer science and I met Shazan freshman year in one of our math classes. We took two math classes together and we sort of just hit it off. We both sort of had similar interests. And one of those interests was sort of finance, um, freedom, economics, mathematics. And I'd say about a year and a half ago, we really got into um, realizing that the current financial system is sort of natively unfair and sort of realizing that people cannot store their value over time unless you sort of have a lot of money and can hire an investment manager. And so we sort of turned to the world of crypto and we tried to sort of take this neutral approach saying, what out there is real, what out there um, can we take seriously, what's really important? And we sort of came back to this idea that we think Bitcoin is the best store of value. And what we're trying to build right now is sort of a wallet around that idea that Bitcoin's the best store of value. So Yeah, exactly um, what James was saying. Basically, we think that in the current financial system, if you're getting paid in like your fiat currency, for example, there's a lot of issues. For example, like James mentioned, if you don't have the time, the knowledge, the money to invest for yourself or hire someone to do so, you're getting constantly devalued by like the monetary inflation that goes on. And there's a lot of other negative externalities to the current fiat system. For example, property rights, property rights are really hard to access and um, the, not, the inflationary aspect of today's money that wages are priced in really puts a lot of the bargaining power on the like, employer versus the worker. So, um, and you can see this playing out as wage growth doesn't like with data keep up with cost of living inflation. So we really came into it thinking that money is just um, really unfair in today's financial system. And as we dove deep into the philosophical, economic and technical aspects of other solutions to money versus the dollar, we came to the conclusion that we believe Bitcoin is the best money and really the foundation to build a more anti-fragile, natively fair financial system on top of. That's great. I mean, we want to talk more about how you came to that conclusion with Bitcoin and such and in a bit, but let's back up for a second. I mean, Shazin, I think you and I first touched base maybe like nine months or a year ago, or I don't know, like you had, this isn't your first time like setting up a business kind of, and you're what, 20 years old or 21, 22, something, right? What, how old are you guys? And tell us a bit, a bit about your first business, you know, that you set up Shazin and how that went. Yeah. I mean, so James and I both have been just like randomly building stuff in the past. And um, I've worked on like a few things with my parents too, in the past, like in high school, my dad used to like flip real estate, which I think okay. you're pretty familiar with. So I, I yeah. did that. And then I worked on apps in the past as well. Like I worked on like some education app in high school and then some other platforms in the past. And really like I, I got some experience building certain platforms, but um, really I think Lava is like the one that I've been most um, excited about and like excited. Like, um, we'll probably talk about Lava more later in the interview, but the one that I think has like the strongest potential to be something really amazing. And um, I think really whatever I've done so far in my life has like really brought me to Bitcoin. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. I mean, so Lava Wallet is the name of the wallet that you guys are kind of building out. And we'll talk about that a little bit. But first, I guess your conclusion that Bitcoin is the best store of value. I mean, Matt, I know you, you we talked a little bit before. You, did you have some thoughts you wanted to ask them about Bitcoin versus Ethereum or something? Yeah, yeah, we could we could probably go pretty deep in a, a couple different directions in there, but yeah, maybe we we could just start at a at a, at a high level. So you know, are you kind of convinced that there's like Bitcoin will be like a the sole winner, or, or how do you think of of kind of other blockchains? And then then um, kind of is, is store of value the kind of most important function for kind of ensuring uh, you know fairness in in the financial system? So if you guys can maybe walk through your your kind of high level bull case on, on, on Bitcoin, that, that would be helpful. I, yeah. Um, well, I can start. Yeah, sure. 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 Um, I, I also like came into this space kind of looking from like an investment perspective. Right. And I think that 
if you really think about it from an investment perspective, I think most of the value is going to flow to whatever is the store of value um, of the future. If that makes sense, because these smart contract platforms, they're comp they're competing with each other. And they're really the tokens of these smart contract platforms, whether or not they're necessary, the main value proposition for them is fees are going to be paid and some fees are going to be allocated to token holders. But as you can imagine, over time, the fees are going to go down because there's going to be natural competition. All this code is open source too. So if you're charging absurdly high fees, someone else can bring in a platform that will charge lower fees. And that's, re that's really why we believe the store of value has the most value to capture as, as, as well as it can really just capture all the monetary premium in the world, which is estimated to be like, and the tr like hundreds of trillions of dollars of potential value capture. So that's why we're both really interested in uh, figuring out, figuring out what, what, what is the best store of value. And I think from a principal perspective, I think there will be only one store of value. I think Bitcoin's kind of like the internet of value and um, the internet really has just like one protocol that wins. And I think with Bitcoin, Bitcoin's going to be like the native currency for the internet, if that makes sense. So I think really at the limit, only one um, currency is going to win, one money is going to win. And I think that's going to be Bitcoin. And, and to sort of to take that from a more uh, technical perspective, one of the reasons why we're super uh, bullish on Bitcoin is because we think that it is the uh, blockchain that optimizes the most for a store of value on layer one. So when you look at certain properties like ease of running a node, it's extremely simple to run a Bitcoin node as opposed to Ethereum or a Solana or even an Avalanche node. Running these sort of alternative nodes are extremely difficult. And but they're extre it's extremely important to be able to do that because that enforces all the rules. So all those incredible properties that we think uh, about when we think about Bitcoin, such as uh, the 21 million supply cap, um, those are enforced by nodes. And it's 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 extremely important that you create a an experience that is extremely um, simple for 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 that to to sort of enforce those properties. And so among a bunch of other things, we think that. Um, Everything, every step that Bitcoin takes is sort of with that uh, perspective and sort of optimization function in mind. And that's the reason why we, we're, we're really optimistic about Bitcoin. And another thing to add is we, we believe that to create this like future store of value, the store of value of the future, um, it will need to be trust minimized. And to be trust minimized, we believe that proof of work is a necessary component in forming the consensus around this trust minimized money database. And uh, there's a lot of theories and data around this, but um, a lot of people believe that there will only be one major proof of work blockchain that will uh, win. And there, this is for a whole set of like network effects that come into play when you think about proof of work. And mm -hmm. Bitcoin has like clearly um, won that battle. Bitcoin has like over of the proof of work blockchains, once Ethereum goes to proof of stake, Bitcoin is going to be, it's going to control greater than like 95% of the, the hash rate that is allocated to proof of work blockchain. So we think once Bitcoin capped, and Bitcoin's already won the game, but it's, it's just getting more and more inevitable over time. And we believe whatever is the native token of that proof of work blockchain is going to be the money. Yeah, yeah. Matt, so, I'm sure you have another follow up question, but real quick, I want to back up. James, you mentioned the nodes. Just explain, like, I'm a five year old, like, what is a node uh, when mm -hmm. it comes to crypto or Bitcoin or avalanche, you know, what exactly is that? I mean, I think I know, but as if I'm five years old, can you explain it to someone mm -hmm. kind of new trying to figure out the basics? So, so nodes sort of have, um, ha have a lot of super important roles. And one of them is enforcing, uh, is it a machine? Uh, is it a computer program? Right, or what is it? Right. Yeah. 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 So it, it, it's a program that can run on your computer. It can run on a server. You could set up a small little computer at your home and run it all the time, or you could mm -hmm. be a business that runs it. Um, it's 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 basically a program that runs on a computer, and a com that computer can be uh, pretty much whatever. Um, can it be on my phone? It well, so potentially it could. There, mm -hmm. there's actually if 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 you look at the um, an HTC phone, they actually creates they created a phone that can run a Bitcoin node. Um, wow. It's a little bit difficult um, right now because the blockchain's uh, size is extremely large. And so you have to have a phone that um, can sort of manage that size. And it's like out your battery pretty quick, probably, right? Your battery life on your phone will run out fast with that. Yeah, yeah. So ex especially initially because, um, mm -hmm. because computing and verifying all those blocks takes a very long time. Mm -hmm. And so one, one, so one of the most important things that a node does is it looks at the blocks that the miners make that are sort of being created. So we have new transactions, they're put on the block, 
they're sort of appended to the blockchain. The nodes, one of their most important jobs is actually making sure that no rules about the Bitcoin network are sort of violated on that block. So making mm -hmm. sure that every transaction is properly signed, making sure that miners did not double spin transactions, making mm -hmm. sure that um, sort of just, just enforcing all the rules. And so that's why it's extremely important. You, 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 you could take a look at something like a gold, for example. And gold sort of has these properties that are endowed by God that like mm -hmm. you cannot create new gold out of thin air, mm -hmm. um, at least not yet, uh, given the kind of physics. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and so uh, you, like, you can sort of view Bitcoin nodes as enforcing these super important properties. These properties that we love about gold, sort of uh, physics prevents us to be, from being able to break them. Nodes in this case, and the mm. pure number of, sheer Good number analogy. of nodes prevents mm -hmm. that. Um, and so that's really what's so important about keeping nodes. And they sort of keep this, uh, they, they keep the Bitcoin network extremely strong. And that's, and, and we think Bitcoin optimizes for making the best node experience, keeping blockchain size down. So it's in fact actually easier to run these nodes. And one thing I'd also like to add to that is like Bitcoin is trying to, put, um, in a sense, if you compare the fiat system today, the node is like the Federal Reserve Bank, right? Mm -hmm. And basically the Federal Reserve Bank basically accounts for all the balances of people who hold the dollar. Bitcoin's basic idea is we shouldn't, this is a central point of failure and it's a point, it's, it's a lot of power that you give to a singular entity that can censor you, that can know exactly what you're doing. Bitcoin's mm -hmm. basic goal is let's distribute this maximally. And the nodes are like, as James mentioned, the distribution of this database. And that's essentially what the blockchain does. It's just a distributed database. And mm -hmm. proof of work is the best way to come to consensus. Proof of work, on, yeah. On changes to that database. And um, yeah, and on, on when new, new coins are added to the database. Yes, so I, I would certainly agree with you. And you know, maybe just to put my own cards on the table, like I, I, I'm mildly, uh, bullish, I would say, on on both Bitcoin and Ethereum, probably slightly more on Ethereum. So I'm kind of coming with with that bias. But um, I mean, it, it, I would agree with you that like Bitcoin is clearly going to win proof of work, right? Like like that's uh, very very clear that you know like, there's just the network effects like you, you spoke about. It it really is the best kind of tool for um, kind of managing um, or, or preserving um, store of value. Uh, I, I think. Proof of work is is like absolutely the optimal tool for that. Um, my question is, you know, are other applications so like you know some of the DAOs and like creative new functionality or uh, in the future I could imagine some sort of like um, lending program like you know like maybe mortgages of the future are run on a blockchain and, and I would imagine in that case you probably want like a proof of stake or you know, like some kind of lower cost to transact. Um, um, uh, fee structure. Obviously, the gas fees on Ethereum are, are really high right now, but uh, presumably with transition to, to proof of stake in the future, um, gas fees are, are almost certainly going to go down to a much more reasonable, what, uh, um, you know, level. But w if you think about like the the broader economy, I mean, are there going to be kind of um, like is the Lightning Network going to uh, be able to handle more of these smaller transactions in the future, more so than it than it's capable of, of doing right now? Or I guess how, where where would you guys diverge from my presumption that you know Ethereum will will win out on on maybe some of the um, more creative um, outlets for uh, the future of finance, whereas Bitcoin, I, I think we both are in agreement that is is going to do really well as a store of value. Yeah. I don't know that question um, was, was so too muddled, but I guess the, yeah. maybe if I could condense it down a little bit, are, are there other functionalities other than just um, um, uh, store of value that you think Bitcoin can handle potentially with things like the ne lightning network down the road? Um, and, and how do you see that kind of uh, playing out? Yeah, for sure. I think so. We believe that the, that there should be like a, um, a more trust minimized financial system that should be built other than just like the trust minimized store of value. And we, we at Lava, we believe that that should happen on Bitcoin because it doesn't really make sense that if you're trying to create a trust minimum, like this, the money is just the base, the foundation of this financial system and all these applications that you're trying to build. And we believe that proof of stake in and of itself has a lot of flaws. Like it's not really, um, even in theory, it's not really that secure. And there's, there's a lot of like problems with proof of stake that even some of the core leads at Ethereum have been like very recently talking about. So we really believe that this anti-fragile financial system must be built on Bitcoin. And 
I think the opportunity here is massive. And we think like Bitcoin can scale. We think like the Lightning Network is a great technology that is already showing that can scale Bitcoin in terms of payment applications. And there's all sorts of other, um, for example, proposal to even scale Bitcoin horizontally. For example, like drive chains are an example that will uh, scale Bitcoin horizontally. And those are all being explored. So we're, we're both really confident that Bitcoin will scale for payments technology. And <clears throat> a lot of these other applications that you're talking about um, can also be built with Bitcoin. For example, we're building um, certain like borrowing and yield applications using Bitcoin and even uh, derivative applications using Bitcoin. And we think that all of these can be built that are still use native Bitcoin. Because if you're using Ethereum and you don't believe Ethereum is like the money of the future, then what money are you using on Ethereum? If you're using these like centralized stable coins, then you're really building these financial primitives on a centralized infrastructure. So it doesn't really, they're not actually really decentralized. And if you're building on Ethereum, which you don't believe is the money of the future, then you can't really access native Bitcoin on Ethereum. So you're not really getting any of the core benefits of creating these more trust minimized financial primitives. So that makes sense. Yeah. And I, I think, I think it's really important to state that a lot of what is being on a, being built on Ethereum is extremely cool. And from a technical perspective, from a mathematical perspective, um, like ZK rollups are sort of like a fascinating idea. And I'm not going to try to discount the sort of like interesting political implications of like a DAO, for example. But mm -hmm. I think um, I think a lot of the times what we're seeing, like particularly in Ethereum, is that there's a lot of technology that's being built without a clear problem that is that it's trying to solve. And I think that's um, and, and I think the best problem that blockchains can solve today is the store value problem. And mm -hmm. that's why we're choosing to work on Bitcoin today. And we're trying to build a financial experience around Bitcoin today. Um, and whether or not down the road, uh, Bitcoin can sort of adopt something like a drive chains, which enables it to have side chains that act similarly to something like Ethereum. Um, that's something that we're willing to discuss. And, I'm, and I, I think the Ethereum community is fascinating. They're filled with like extremely smart people doing really cool stuff. Um, so the, and the I, side chains, it, the horizontal, um, is that like some other blockchain that's created that's pegged to Bitcoin? Like you peg another currency to the dollar, you're pegging another crypto blockchain to Bitcoin's value. Is that sort of similar way to think of it? It's ex uh, that's exactly it. So the idea is that like between like that. these be between these drive chains, you can act. So it's 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 a little political within the Bitcoin community, sort of like mm -hmm. the discussion of drive chains right now. But the idea is that you have these side chains that, for example, could look like Ethereum, could look like Zcash with privacy, mm -hmm. and you can maintain like a one to one peg uh, between Bitcoin layer one and these side chains, and hopefully mm -hmm. open up a bunch of uh, different scalability options and um, open up the world to these really interesting ideas. Um, and and what's also really fascinating is that it can actually inherit the mining of Bitcoin. So hmm. using something called blind merge mining, it can actually use the mining of Bitcoin and miners don't even have to know that they're mining it. So there's a lot of cool opportunities down the road. Um, I think I think Ethereum is fascinating. Um, um, and I, I think that a lot of these projects are really, really cool. Uh, but if I were to like a, try to find a place to store my value and try to build a financial experience around that value, I would choose Bitcoin. And that's what we're trying to do. We recognize it's extremely important to build a financial experience around Bitcoin. And yeah, ultimately that's our goal. Yeah, exactly. I, I think we could exactly all agree that, uh, I think we could all agree that JPEGs of monkeys are not necessarily solving any important kind of financial <laughs> problem out there in the world. Yeah. So <laughs> I think we, there's certainly some truth yeah. to yeah. that. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's, Basically, like the problems that Ethereum is trying to address, like borrowing, for example, more trust minimized borrowing, yield, um, even like getting people organized around a cause, for example, are very interesting problems. But oftentimes what we're realizing is the solutions, the solutions might not be what Ethereum is necessarily proposing is the solution to solve these problems. But there's like a whole set of like drive chain applications that could be done. We're working a lot with like um, applications on Bitcoin layer one. Lightning is also really fascinating. There's a whole other um, technology called uh, decentralized identifiers, like press verifiable credentials that we believe are actually more scalable, cheaper and private solutions to a lot of these NFTs that are trying to, like that Ethereum is trying to propose as a solution to these problems. So like the main idea is the space is interesting. It's just, maybe that's not the solution. And um, ultimately the, I think a lot of the value capture is not going to go to these native tokens because these protocols are ultimately peer to peer. So you don't really need to have an intermediary that's um, mm. abstract, like taking value for itself. Ult ultimately all, all the value will flow to the edges and at the edge is really just the money that the users hold. And that's where we, we, that's where we think that 
all the value in the space is really going to be captured. Yeah. Yeah. yeah an interesting. I've always thought that, like, if there is to be a digital gold, then I don't see how Bitcoin would not be that. You know, I've said that for a long time, and it just rings true to me really well. Like, you know, Bitcoin is the obvious choice for digital gold if there is ever to be an actual digital gold that you know persists. And uh, and it sounds like on top of being just a store of value, like that that real physical gold is in the digital world. You can actually start doing stuff with the, you know, the Lightning Network and these uh, kind of ex- expanding to side chains and stuff. Is that sort of what you're saying? Like, there's more functionality to it than just being a store of value in itself. That you can actually do stuff with it with this uh, with this new new stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what we're saying. We're saying um, that really at the core, Bitcoin's going to be the money, but these these all these primitives are going to be built around Bitcoin. That ideally also use native Bitcoin. Like one of the biggest mm-hmm. problems with the Bitcoin on Ethereum is it's wrapped. And when you start wrapping Ethereum, you give up custody of it. So really, that's why we're really focused on trying trying to really maximize the ability for people to use native Bitcoin and give up as little trust as possible. Um, so that that's exactly what we believe that um, will that you will see play out over the next few years um, with support of like Lava and other teams that are really focusing on building these financial primitives on Bitcoin. Because the whole idea of Bitcoin at its core, um, as previously envisioned is make Bitcoin stable and secure. And really, if you're trying to have like money that scales to hundreds of trillions of dollars in market cap, you need it to be stable and secure and not changing because once you start changing it too much, you introduce risks of exploits of bugs that you see on these other blockchains, for example. And you also give a lot of power to developers if you start constantly changing the protocol, because then developers have a lot more influence because they're more needed. When Bitcoin stop, when Bitcoin's very stable and secure and not changing as much, you start building layers around it. So you build like the Lightning Network, which scales, which doesn't really affect, and changes to the Lightning Network don't really affect Bitcoin, the blockchain, mm-hmm. for example. And these other applications that Lava is building scale in layers and don't really um, increase the risk for exploits on Bitcoin layer one. And that's essentially mm-hmm. the idea of Bitcoin. Yeah, I've heard the Lightning Network being talked about for maybe like five years now. I don't know. I mean, I've been invested in Bitcoin since 2011 or so or 12. But, you know, I remember uh, I only bought a little bit. So I've always followed it and listened to things. And, you know, bit, the Bitcoin bug bit me early and I was really into it. And um, in the last few years, I guess, uh, in the last hype cycle of the Bitcoin price, I get, you know, I feel like I, I, I was not as enthusiastic as so many other people I saw, like, talking it up like crypto bulls and stuff. And I still thought like, oh, digital gold, but I'm not sure what else. But now more recently in the last, you know, year or so, I feel like now the price is sort of stabilized around 40 to 50,000, something like that. Then I feel like, you know, maybe there is a, a more to this, you know, and, and talking to you guys a lot and seeing what you guys are doing. I'm starting to realize, you know, maybe, maybe Bitcoin is it. And it's just taking time for the technology to catch up to Bitcoin. Maybe like the Ethereum avalanche, all that stuff is kind of like dry runs of functionality theory. But now the technology for doing that around Bitcoin is around is available, like with the Lightning Network and the side chains. Now all that functionality that was dreamed up with Ethereum can now be employed on actual Bitcoin. Um, that's sort of what I'm thinking as like a bull case for Bitcoin at the moment. Um, but a lot of that's around like something like the Lightning Network, which has been talked about for years. But is it really working, the Lightning Network? Is it functional? I mean, I've, you know, is, is it going to take away the concern of energy usage for Bitcoin transactions to a large degree? Because I think that's a big concern is the actual energy usage that is going to mining Bitcoin and such and verifying transactions and can the Lightning Network number one resolve some of that energy usage concern and number two. Is it as, you know, when, when are we going to, is it really functional yet? I mean, it, it, you know, tell us, I guess, those two things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so um, 2021 was a super important year for the Lightning Network. In particular, we saw like many more nodes sort of come onto the Lightning Network, providing much more liquidity. And so if you look at the probability of Lightning transactions being successful, it's like through the roof. And mm. I personally never, uh, like in the last couple of months, I've never experienced a Lightning transaction that has not worked for me mm. personally. Um, and so it's, it's one of those no, things that work, what happens, you lose your Bitcoin or it just gets rejected. You don't lose your Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, you, you wouldn't lose your Bitcoin. Yeah. That'd be terrible. You, you wouldn't lose your Bitcoin. Basically the, the, the high level reason why some transactions were not working is because the lightning network is composed of a bunch of nodes and these mm-hmm. nodes all have liquidity. 
if they don't have sufficient liquidity to route transactions through that node, then they could potentially fail. But mm-hmm. sort of the Lightning Network, particularly in 2021, grew to such a huge extent that there are now in, like incredible number of nodes providing massive amounts of liquidity that um, uh, that it's becoming more like it's 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 very hard for transactions to to fail now, uh, particularly if they're of everyday normal sizes. Like if I'm buying a coffee, for instance, um, mm-hmm. that size is that 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 size of transaction would only be around five dollars. Um, I can definitely expect that to go through. There's going to be no liquidity problem there. Mm-hmm. So. I, I, I think as the Lightning Network sort of matures over time, sort of, and, and grows over time, the potential for it to uh, be useful and be more resilient is 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 really just a function of its growth. It's, it's directly correlated with that, and I do think it's important to um, to scale Bitcoin uh, to an extent. Um, if you can wi- if you can wind up many different transactions onto like one uh, Bitcoin layer one transaction, then that that's a huge benefit for the efficiency of Bitcoin. You sort of view Lightning Network as your Visa layer, where you perform a bunch of small different transactions, and you have um, you have the Bitcoin base layer one as your um, wire or ACH, where you sort of spend more money to to execute something. It takes more resources on the bank's part, or in Bitcoin's case, the blockchain's part. But um, you you have it's 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 just different settlement mechanisms, and we think yeah. that that's extremely important uh, for Bitcoin moving forward. Yeah, and it kind of reminds me of something. I think we touched base on when we were talking last was that the way you, it's described is sort of like um, in the brokerage uh, financial services world, uh, brokers have to clear uh, mm-hmm. equity transactions with each other, for example, on the depository trust company. That's the clearing system, DTC. And, you know, you can imagine Robinhood has millions of, you know, sh- small trades and interactive brokers has millions of trades. And they have to kind of clear instead of one by one trying to match them, they do something called continuous net settlement, which kind of like aggregates it all to be the most efficient. And that's sort of what Lightning Network is providing at the block at the Bitcoin level. It seems like it's sort of like aggregating it all to kind of be one efficient transaction from time to time that needs to happen or something. Is that is that sort of right? Yeah, exactly. And as Lightning scales and Bitcoin, like when Bitcoin scales, transaction throughput, energy. Um, through like input does not scale linearly. That's because like lightning network, if you can imagine if like a lightning channel is like you're maybe experiencing 10,000 transactions on lightning, that doesn't scale Bitcoin um, energy input by 10,000 X because all those transactions are not really causing more minor input and minor energy costs. So we really believe like Mm -hmm. um, when Bitcoin scales and transactions and like the amount of transactions like increase with Bitcoin increase, like energy input is not going to increase linearly. Although we do believe that um, Bitcoin's energy input is a necessary feature and not a bug. We think that, for example, there is no other solution. Proof of work is necessary to create this mechanism, but um, Bitcoin's not going to like, consume all the energy in the world, if, if you can imagine. Hmm. Matt, are you there? I think you're on mute, Matt. Sorry, I had kids going in the background, so I muted my mic. Sorry about that. Um, so I, I'm just wondering, do you guys have a, a kind of sure. view on, you know, like how how big the I guess market cap or price of Bitcoin would reach? And you don't need to give a like an actual price estimate, but in, in terms of the kind of addressable market, I mean, is it is the goal to kind of replace yeah. fiat currency as as or like the U.S. dollar as the reserve, or how how big do you do you view the opportunity in terms of uh, what's going to be displaced by Bitcoin in the future? Yeah, I think that the opportunity for Bitcoin is massive. I think it can capture all of the monetary premium. Um, in, the- in theory, the-, the-, the total addressable market is all of the monetary premium, as you can imagine, that's stored in the world. So you can imagine like uh, like gold and um, art, for example, um, and like fiat currencies, negative yielding bonds, like overvalued companies, like overvalued real estate. You can imagine a lot of that can be captured by Bitcoin. It's not saying that all of it is going to be captured by Bitcoin. I'm just saying this is the total addressable market for Bitcoin. Um, and I think that like while Bitcoin is monetizing as money, the US dollar is actually um, also going to receive a lot of um, just general like increase in demand. So like, for example, one product that Lava is focusing on building right now is borrowing. So letting people... Um, borrows stable coins, so dollars in the form of stable coins against Bitcoin as collateral. The idea here is to create a trust minimized system to let people 
store their value in Bitcoin and still get a price expo exposure to Bitcoin, but borrow stable coins to spend on day-to-day -day transactions. And as you can imagine, that actually increases demand for dollars worldwide because dollars are actually like the stable spending money, while Bitcoin is the collateral and the savings technology. So we really be believe that currently, um, and for like for the foreseeable future, there is demand that can be served by both like fiat currencies like the dollar and Bitcoin. So, so you're not in the, the Uber maximalist Neat. camp so, of... Sorry, Matt, go ahead. No, sorry, no, you, you go ahead, Emmett. I was just going to say, um, so yeah, the Lava Wallet, that's like kind of like your thing. And just to disclose, uh, I personally have invested with you guys. You've got a number of investors, obviously. I'm, I uh, feel honored to be one of your uh, investors in Lava Wallet. Can you explain what this is at a high level of view and why it's different from other wallets, by perhaps? Yeah, for sure. So basically, um, we believe in Bitcoin as being the money. But right now, to experience a lot of your core financial primitives using Bitcoin, even like, for example, transactions, borrowing, um, yield, and even like swaps or exposure to some other assets, you have to give up custody. And once you start giving up your custody, like your ownership over your Bitcoin, um, you don't get a lot of the benefits that Bitcoin is supposed to give you. So our goal is really to build a non-custodial wallet that lets users access transactions, borrowing, yield, and a lot of other financial primitives that we believe are necessary and you see on happening, being accessed on Ethereum and let Bitcoin users access those. And also let Bitcoin users access them in the most simple way possible. So we're really focused on building the best user experience for Bitcoin. And we think that with Lava, we can actually create, not only drive the adoption of a trust minimized money, but also a trust minimized financial system that also works for users all around the world. Yeah. And I, I think sort of a big inspiration for this is that, I mean, I, I use Bitcoin wallets day to day. I've tried to set up my dad with a Bitcoin wallet. He's sort of gone into Bitcoin recently. And the, the user experience is just, it's such a huge barrier to entry. And mm -hmm. I think that if as a Bitcoin community, we want to onboard the world to Bitcoin and we want to make uh, sort of make it the, the future store of value, uh, experiences for Bitcoin need to really change. I think that's one of the biggest problems with Bitcoin. And I think that's something that Ethereum has done relatively well is um, it's, it's, it's made a really great, uh, Ethereum has made a really great experience around Ethereum uh, for the most part. And I think that's something that Bitcoin can learn a lot from is, is bringing these great experiences over to Bitcoin as well. And um, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make something that's comprehensive and easy to use uh, for somebody that wants absolute sovereignty over their money. Yeah, and the sovereignty is like a key piece of what we're trying to focus on because really we believe that if you scale using just custodial solutions, there there's a lot of room for error as time goes on. You don't even know if your Bitcoin is your Bitcoin. It can be confiscated. Um, it can actually even not be um, non-inflationary because custodial providers could tell you you have th that you have an IOU for Bitcoin, but not have that IOU backed one mm. back one by one. So that's why we're really focusing on building a non-custodial experience. So yeah, I think that's a good I idea. I'm a, I, I definitely fall into the category of, of somebody who likes the kind of cleaner, easier user experience. Like as as much yeah. as I kind of like crypto and am and bullish about the you know the the outlook going forward in, in general, I'm not technical enough to to want to handle a lot of these these situations. So you know, I, I'm a, I'm a customer of Coinbase, for example. It's just like all right, it's clean, it's easy. They'll help me with like you know tax documentation, whatever. Um, what, what have you guys, how, how have you kind of managed to in, in Lava Wallet to try to make that user experience just a little bit more approachable? And I guess, how do you, um, compete with, or, or stack up to maybe some of the other, um, competitors out there who are, are offering wallets? What's, what's differentiated about, about Lava Wallet and what you guys are trying to do there? Yeah, for sure. So one, one of the biggest differentiators for us is we're actually building a lot of new primitives for Bitcoin. So like borrowing um, and really trying to get users to access those. So a lot of Bitcoin wallets today you'll find at best, they're offering just custody and transactions. We're really trying to bring on like a whole set of other primitives like um, default privacy, borrowing, yield, and really trying to make those as easy as possible. And the other thing in terms of just user experience, one of our like key insights is really trying to minimize the number of clicks that a user has to make um, to achieve any task that they're um, interested in achieving. So instead of having them click like five times and like worry about all these like Uniswap tools, for example, we just want them to go into the wallet, achieve the task in two clicks and then leave the wallet. Really make finance simple. We think a lot of crypto, for example, today, 
makes finance even more complicated because you have to worry about all these other tokens, whether you want to like earn a yield on this pool versus this pool. The whole goal of Bitcoin is you really ideally have to just worry about your savings technology, which is your Bitcoin, and then your spending currency, which is like your dollars, for example. And we want to make that experience simple so that users ideally have to spend only a few minutes every week worrying about their finance or ideally no, no, no time worrying, just like a few minutes every month just managing their finances. And I, I think sort of uh, so, so something that's interesting, like a, a lot of Bitcoin wallets will really try to ex like expose the nitty gritty of what is being done sort of behind the scenes. Like you have to manage your UTXOs and like 80% of people that we want or 95% of people we want to get into Bitcoin don't need to care about that and like managing privacy on by themselves. And like if we can sort of optimize that workflow behind the scenes and only spend uh, coins that have sort of gone through the privacy like process and only sort of and do a lot of that abstractions behind the scenes things that most crypto wallets would sort of expose to the users that would be great because if you go to your bank now and you say i want to buy like some shares in tesla like they're not going to like tell you which market maker they use and who they're wiring money to and how they're executing all that behind the scenes they're just going to do it for you mm -hmm. and in crypto we have this like weird thing where um i think it's because everybody's like technically savvy they they want to maybe do it themselves. And there's like this weird sort of, I guess, I don't know, this, this, this weird it's sort of thing. Trust issue. Where, Everyone wants to see what's going right. on behind the scenes with the crypto. Right. It's like they, but you, you can still maintain trust by making your code publicly verifiable to people that want to do that. But everybody, like everything needs to be exposed. And it just gets so confused, confusing when you have to talk about different tokens and different protocols and like users ideally shouldn't even have to worry about what the lightning network is. Like it's it's like add, adding new like new, new vocabulary is just not useful, and yeah. most people it's 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 not going to work in the long term. And I think that's what's really important to us. Like we're using discrete law contracts behind the scenes for borrowing. Nobody really needs to know that. But I think that a lot of wallets nowadays would try to expose that information and try to, um, and and it, it's it, I don't think it's working very well for the ecosystem. Is my point? It's mm. it's really interesting. You know, it, it actually I think you guys are absolutely right. It kind of reminds me of of an experience in in the energy industry. You know, maybe I don't know seven years ago or so when energy efficiency became this this big thing and and homes had the smart meters for the first time. So there were all these companies that kind of came out of the woodwork launching, saying like, oh, we're gonna like give give you like all this data about your home energy usage and so like they would have these like reports of like oh at like 415 you had like a two kilowatt <laughs> spike in your energy usage so like you should look into that and like what they found is like customers just don't care like people like no. don't want to dive into how their like, home energy you know is used they want like broadly speaking they want like a lower monthly bill but you know they don't want to spend two hours a month trying to save like you know 10 percent on their you know hundred dollar electric bill it's just not worth the time and it's not interesting to them and i think the mm -hmm. same thing is absolutely a parallel here in this space where you know non-technical people generally speaking just want the product to work and they don't need to to know all the nitty gritties so but i think with where we are right now i mean so many of the adopters are kind of like that early adopter class that genuinely loves you know the nitty gritty details um but i think mm -hmm. You guys are, are right to trying to be focused on on building it for the general consumer, not like the not the Bitcoin technical enthusiast. Yeah, a, a, a lot of our attitude, like the, this, this is sort of another example. It's like we have the we're we're going to have the ability behind the scenes to sort of um, in, in increase privacy of your coins, which also helps increase the fungibility. And the idea is that if the user had to go do that themselves and learn about really what that was, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't take the 10, 15 minutes to sit down, learn about it, and then go about and actually improve the privacy of their coins. But if you can make that a switch that a, a user, all they have to do is just swipe this toggle and now their holdings are private, they're going to do that. I mean, Apple sort of showed us when they introduced all these new privacy features to email, um, to, to their email services in Safari, um, they, people were just super willing to adopt it um, just by pressing a button. And I think that's really the attitude Bitcoin needs to take. They need to make things one click, really easy. Um, and it needs to be very delightful user experiences and users should not have to worry about uh, particular details um, to sort of maintain their sovereignty, privacy, stuff like that. So, a good analogy, what separates you guys, uh, your wallet is the self-custody aspect, right? That's like the big differentiator and also making it simple and a delightful experience, obviously. That's the key too, right? And functionality. Yeah. 
you know, adding into it, right? With whether it's having your Bitcoin lent out for you to earn rev yield or just using it at Starbucks very simply and easily. Um, so it's ultimately going to be like an app on your phone of some sort, I would imagine, right? And and how is it self custodied? Like, is it embedded in my phone itself? So if my phone drops in the toilet, do I lose my Bitcoin or like what? How does that work? I mean, what's a good way to think about it? Like when I think of self custody of gold, physical gold, I'm thinking I have gold bars under my bed, you know, but if my house burns down or a thief comes and, you know, if, if my house gets swallowed up in an earthquake, I lose that physical gold forever, right? So what's a good analogy for the self-custody of the Bitcoin on your wallet, on the app, on the phone, or how does that work? Can you talk to us a little yeah. bit about that? So for like your Bitcoin, you, you pretty much have like, I'd like to use the analogy of like a stamp. So you basically have like a stamp, right? And every time you want to make you, you have like your ledger, all your money. And every, every time you want to spend that, you have to stamp your approval that, hey, I'm actually wanting to spend that money. So that stamp is actually stored on the device. But let's say you lose that stamp, you lose the device, you can actually still recover um, your Bitcoin by having like a password to that stamp. Since that stamp is in a sense digital, you can actually have like a password, a few words that you would want to memorize or write down and store somewhere in like a safety deposit box. Mm -hmm. And even if you lost your phone, you would actually still be able to recover. That stamp. Your, the stamp is held stamp. in some database that you guys would maintain or something. Is that right? It's actually stored client side. Okay. So how is it stored client side? What does that mean? Like the stamp is... Uh... Where is it? If if I if I lost my phone and I need to get my passphrase to get my new my stamp back, how how does that work? Like walk me through that. Yeah, so um, the stamp it depends on like the phone that you're using. The stamp's actually stored like, um, for example, on like the Apple Keychain, right? And the words that like when you lose your phone, like your your phone's gone, but the mm -hmm. words actually help us recover what that stamp originally was because the words were used to determine what the stamp is. And then once you actually have those words. So you can, you can recreate actually... the stamp basically with those words, those unique words. You're recreating exactly. the stamp. Okay. Because your money is ultimately stored on the blockchain, which is mm -hmm. which is stored by all these nodes that enforce the rules of the blockchain. And the nodes know that once you sign a transaction with your stamp, that that's like that can be sent to you, right? So I see. The words can just help you the stamp is like digital. Imagine like the stamp is Emmet. And yeah. Emmet is the stamp. The the and let's say you just didn't remember what the stamp was and you just don't know what the stamp is. The the like let's say you memorize twelve words. Those twelve words will help reveal what the stamp actually was. And once you reveal what the stamp is, you can actually take that money that you had that the stamp can only sign transactions with, and then create like a new wallet with the new stamp, for example. Mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's the I'll, same stamp, but it's just replicated. Is that right? Using those right. twelve words, they kind of like. Yeah recreates the same stamp that I had lost, but on a new wallet. Okay. Exactly. So you don't want to give anyone access to those 12 words. Sure. You can memorize them, put them in a bank safety deposit box. But those words is just the most important aspect of this thing. Those words will help you. If you don't want to memorize the stamp itself, those words will help you recover that stamp. Okay. Um, and so the self custody thing, uh, I guess just, Owning those words is the way of custodying the Bitcoin myself in a way, right? Just the fact that I'm the only one that has those 12, that passphrase of the 12 or 20 words or whatever the passphrase is like that. That's my custody is like my digital gold bars under my bed is sort of equivalent in a way to like those 12 or 20 words or whatever in my safety deposit box. If that safety deposit box gets lost uh, and I lose my stamp on my phone at the same time, then I'm screwed. That's the way you'd be screwed, sort of, right? Right, and and I think um, I, I I think it's fascinating, sort of like how cryptography has enabled us to sort of enforce property rights through information. Mm -hmm. all, all it takes is information. I, I think that's like a very like there there are really fascinating like philosophical implications of that. And I think um, I think it's what what another thing that we're trying to do at Lava is trying to facilitate um, the, the best experience around um, like s memorizing or storing those words, because I think that's one of the most significant barriers to entry mm. to people in crypto in general is trying to understand why they need these words. Why yeah. are these words important? Um, and yeah. one of our, one, 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 one of our goals in like when you're trying, when you're actually like looking at these words um, yeah. is, is to you, you through our user experience to make that extremely clear. 
And so we we're toying around with certain ideas. We haven't like solidified anything yet, but one of our big goals is making that um, abundantly clear, making our intentions super clear there. And um, may, maybe like shining some light into the, like what we think is really fascinating and really cool um, and, and making that a little bit easier for uh, people to swallow. And we can also create back, like for example, for users who don't want complete sovereignty, there, there are other ways that they can actually back up those 12 words. They could write them down, put them on a metal plate. They could, yeah. um, even or if they, they can give it to, to their, they give it to some other, cause they can give it to a bank or some mm -hmm. other trust provider, you know, sort, sort of like I, what you do when you're, when you're giving your, your, your Bitcoin to Coinbase or Robinhood or whatever, it's yeah. like, it's there that you're giving them the responsibility to hold it for you. But at the same time, they could be doing some shady DeFi things with your Bitcoin, maybe on the back end that you don't even know, you know, it's an IOU they well, just have or they give you or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if I mean, feasibly, if you like, let's say that you wrote down your seed phrase, your 12 words or whatever, and you gave it to somebody else, you would always be able to transparently mod, uh, mod like, look at what's happening to mm. those Bitcoins that you own. So they wouldn't be able to go off and do something crazy with it. And mm. what's really cool is like, um, because like, there's so much interest in cryptography and like information theory involved, you can actually create like these really interesting trust models where you let, let's say that there's an, a, a business or entity of three people. And you want any two of those three people to be able to redeem the Bitcoin. You can set that up and sort of set up these like really fascinating like um, escrow or treasuries. And I think mm. that it, it opens up the uh, like a family like, account or a family. Right. Bitcoin so, like, pool. Yeah. so like maybe you can imagine like a like a like two spouses have two of three, uh, two of three like stamps. And then the third stamp is some other uh, third party such that if one of the two spouses lose theirs and the the third party can come and help them. But the third party at no point in time could just run off with the money is mm. the idea. And so mm. there, there, there are like a lot of really interesting, um, there are a lot of really interesting ideas that can come out of this. And I think there's a lot of room for super cool creativity um, that will just have to come with time and adoption. Neat. So, so where Neat. are you guys kind of in the, in the business life cycle? I mean, obviously you, you raised money recently. Uh, where, where's your, you know, product, How, are you, are you launched with a, with a somewhat broad customer base right now, or could you just give us an idea of where you are? And then also just what, what is it like running a, running a business like this? Got to, I would imagine be exhausting and exhilarating at the same time. And just love to hear your, yeah, your personal sure. experiences with it. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's up. James and I have definitely been working a lot and there's, there's a lot of little bitty things that need to go on and, um, a lot of iterations while building like a startup, but right now we've, we're also hiring. So we're hiring like great developers who want to join our team. And in terms of the product cycle, we're, we're in the process of launching like our beta, which will be like a closed beta, but that will like uh, slowly increase over time. And the goal is really during the beta to work out all the bugs and make sure the user experience is really amazing before launching uh, publicly. So we're in the process of hiring, building out that beta and really trying to uh, make sure that the core tech that we're building is trust minimized and an amazing user experience. And yeah, I think like uh, like a lot of our day to day is just hiring and then developing. Like we have to sit down, like look at new ideas, sort of process them, um, choose whether we want to implement them, and sort of like do this big uh, deep technical dive. So it, it, it's been a blast, but it's certainly been a ton of work, um, yeah. um, which 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 I think is good. Well, I think it's just, it's just a super interesting space. We think there's like a massive demand for this product. We've seen like a lot of support from like the Bitcoin community, other communities like, and other people like Emmett, for example. And we think that it's a great space to be involved in. I think there's a lot of opportunity to grow. I think Bitcoin is like surprisingly early in its um, life cycle right now. I think it's like, people think it's like a trillion dollar asset about, <laughs> but it's like kind of too late. It's I, I, I personally think there's at least a hundred X from here to go. And I think that, there's a lot more room for just startups and people who want to build in the space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you guys are really impressive to me. I love the way you guys think about this stuff. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's incredible. I mean, I never got your age, 21, 22. What is the age? Tell 21. us. 21. 21. 21. I mean, I can't believe how much you guys have absorbed in the last, you know, since you've probably been thinking, when did you first start thinking about Bitcoin at like 15, 16, 17, 18? I don't know what well, age. I was like first exposed to it uh, via my dad, like at 14, I think. Oh, okay. Um, and so he was like, um, yeah, he, he was into gold for, for a decent, he still is. Um, uh, but uh, so he was just like, oh, yo, James, like, 
let's take like have you heard of bitcoin and he showed me it and he's like Can i buy any i was like i don't know and he didn't end up doing it which i guess was a big mistake on his part but um probably was just now, too technically hard right it was probably too technical well, yeah exactly he just was like yeah. if i understood it then i would do it but i just don't understand it and yeah um that, that was his reasoning but um i guess it was like the a year ago i really started to get like a, around like a little over a year ago i really started to dedicate do more a lot of a deep time dive on it yeah, yeah, yeah for sure and um i mean like james I think a lot of us heard about Bitcoin back in like 2017 or at that time era, but I was in high school, super busy working on like random work. But I think it was like around like uh, two years ago almost that I got into Bitcoin. It was really when like I saw the big stock market crash two years ago, if you guys remember that in like March. The COVID or, crash. Uh, yeah. yeah. The COVID crash. And that really got me fascinated about like understanding money and like why that happened and really taking a deep dive into like economics, how economics works, really trying to approach it from a first principles perspective. and that got me into the Bitcoin rabbit hole. And I mean, I haven't stopped thinking about Bitcoin ever since then. I think about it like all the times. James and I- You are obsessed like, about it. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, James and I spent like hours talking about Bitcoin and all this entire space for um, for months. And I think that's yeah. when we really started thinking about it. And also looking at the problems that Bitcoin has and really our goal is to solve these problems that Bitcoin has today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, neat. My favorite uh, Elon Musk quote, speaking of money, is uh, he says, uh, um, money is, is simply an information system for the allocation of labor. Mm -hmm. So when I think about it from that like angle, it, it means something almost completely different to me than what I normally think of it. It's, it's interesting. So maybe Bitcoin will be the new allocation of labor in the future. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, I think Bitcoin, I think like the non-inflationary like money is, I think, in, in my opinion, just like a database, right? It's like a database that um, yeah. people sort of value in the, and defer consumption to later. And I think the, uh, the fact that the, the Bitcoin is non-inflationary, I think, creates um, a lot of cool, like, positive externalities. For example, um, it, like, shifts a lot of bargaining power from, like, the employer to the worker. So mm -hmm. whereas before, like, you see your cost of living increase year over year, you have mm -hmm. to constantly negotiate with your employer to get a raise. In mm -hmm. the Bitcoin system, for example, um, the negotiations of if the salary is priced in Bitcoin, you actually the, the employer will have to come to you and negotiate a, a down raise, which is <laughs> um, which is a, it's it's, it's a bar the bargaining power shifts to the employee because the employer has a lot more power in this system. Interesting, and can be a lot more fairly. Mm -hmm. And then also, I think the fact that if people start getting paid in Bitcoin, uh, let's say five, ten years from now. They won't actually have to necessarily even worry about investing. They won't have to worry about like necessarily invest, choosing whether to invest in Tesla stock or Square stock. They'll yeah. just have to. They can actually store their value and know that, like, no one's actually just unfairly devaluing them. Yeah. And any any investment there would be looking at like a true cost of capital. Like Bitcoin actually creates like a true cost of capital, and then anyone who's trying to invest will actually um, put in extra effort to make sure their investment compounds greater than just the the risk plus like the deflation rate on Bitcoin. And I think there's a lot of other cool things like price signals become a lot cleaner in like the non-inflationary money system because you can see why if prices are going up, why exactly it's going up? Is it because people are printing more money or is it because the demand for the service has increased? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. And you guys are on Twitter, right? I, we'll put your stuff in our, our thing. It's like Lava Wallet or something like that on Twitter. Is that right? Yeah, it's uh, Lava underscore XYZ. Lava underscore XYZ. Okay, we'll make sure to put that in the notes. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, we end our interviews uh, starting in February this year with, uh, you know, part of our, uh, our funds prospectus or mandate now is to give out fees to charity that we take in a certain 50% of the fees after expense. So we're giving out $2,500 to charity of the interviewee's choice. What, what charity uh, would you guys like us to, to give $2,500 to on your behalf? And, and uh, tell us a little bit about, about why you picked that one. Do you want to go? You can do another area. Um, yeah. So, um, so I, I guess, I guess the one we'll, we'll go with is, um, I guess the one we'll go with is, is, is the, the Himalayan cataract project. And the main reason why, um, sort of like that, uh, like I was thinking about this, this problem, I haven't dedicated a ton of time sort of researching charities, um, but something that caught my mind, and this is where I was sort of like decided to do a little bit more research on was like cataract project. And it seems like the reason why I was so fascinated about it is because it seems like vision is such a, like a, a, an important thing to like experiencing a vivid life. 
Oh, and yeah. <laughs> there are certain parts of this world that don't have access to, um, like, surgeries for, um, for, for, for easily treatable things like cataracts. Like, the surger mm. surgical procedure is not that involved. It can be performed in most areas of the world. The problem is just getting resources to those world. And I thought, like, just... I, I just did a little bit more research and I, I thought that was what seemed really cool to me, giving people the ability to have a more vivid life, particularly when it's not um, that difficult. We just need to get the resources there. And I don't know if she's on one yeah. to that. Yeah, I've seen some like videos about like people gaining sight and I think it's just like beautiful. I, I, I agree. It's, yeah. just, it's just like, so beautiful. <laughs> it almost makes, it, it makes me cry. I mean, I think it's just like amazing thing that you can see someone just experience like a like sense and like you'll, you'll see the videos and people are just like, like astounded it i think just like you you improve that person's life so significantly i think every individual life is so important and yeah i think it's just a great cause mm -hmm. it, it absolutely is i i uh, did a bit of a dive on uh i don't know if you guys are, are have you heard of the ever and eye hospital in, in india before it's um uh, kind of kind of similar they, they um specialize in providing like very high efficiency like cataract surgery basically to, to low income people in india and it's mm -hmm. it's just amazing mm -hmm. what an impact that gift of, of you know sight can can have to so many people and it is so treatable and in in many cases it's just a matter of being able to pay for, for so many people so i think it's a it's, mm -hmm. a it's a great charity that you guys have chosen and and i, I think it'll certainly go go a ways to uh changing some people's lives there so i think uh thank you so much for doing the research on that yeah, we'll put that in our show notes. We'll, we'll make sure to put the charities in the show notes of our interviews as well for anyone else that wants to donate. But I agree, you know, the sense of sight is the most important sense for us humans, at least. I mean, animals have a much, you know, they, they destroy us on sense of smell and pretty much all the other senses we think. But sense of sight is the only thing we're somewhat comparable to a lot of other animals uh, on the planet, which is interesting. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, anyway... Um, yeah. I, I think that's a great project and, uh, yeah, restoring sight to people is tremendous. Um, yeah. So we're happy to learn about it and donate to it. Thanks. Thanks for your research and suggestion on that one. Yeah. And thank you for, um, also donating and sure. like, having that cause sure. involved in like your fund, for example, I think that's like a really, um, different way of looking at finance. Oftentimes yeah. you see finance being viewed as this like hyper capitalist, um, yeah. <laughs> industry and yeah. I, think, I think what you guys are doing uh, makes sense and also just like uh, making donating and certain charities promoting them publicly can like put out people put it on people's radars because i think oftentimes we just don't think about it yeah yeah no we're looking forward to keeping this going and hopefully uh getting the amount we can donate higher in the future so um yeah, with that, we'll end it. Thanks, guys, for coming on. Maybe we'll have you back on in a, a year when Bitcoin hits 100,000 to talk a little <laughs> bit about uh, technical analysis of Bitcoin. Techn no, just kidding. I don't like technical analysis. But, you know, uh, we could talk about just the price of Bitcoin and stuff. So uh, we would love to have you guys on again and, and hear about how things are going with Lava Wallet. And uh, we'll follow you on Twitter and put your contact info in the notes if anyone's interested, any developers watching. Uh, you guys are, I think, a great team to work with. So... Look forward to seeing how things go. Thanks a lot for your time. Yeah, thank you for your support and having true. us on. Yeah, and great to meet you, great. Susan, James. Thanks for coming on. It's great talking to you. All yeah. right. Oh, All right.